views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone, welcome to OpenBXRX Remote, brought to you from my living workspace, Chari Executive Suite. I'm Rina Anadin, your host, Y Café con Leche, every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll hear about the iRaise Girls and Boys uh, International Corporation and the different ways the organization is providing virtual workshops and resources for kids and parents' mental wellness, dealing with self-isolation, social distancing, and remote learning. After that, we'll share a socially conscious way to celebrate Independence Weekend as the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and Voices of a People's History of the United States premiere a video celebrating the social justice heroes of past and present featuring spoken word performances. Then we'll speak to artist Mia Roman about her stylish, creative, and safe masks you can use while stepping outdoors as New York City continues reopening. Later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features dancer and choreographer Amanda Castro, who will bless us with a passionate performance high in the sky you don't want to miss. So, sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way, because now we are officially open. to open. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café con Leche for the next hour, encouraging you to get social with us online, that is. Tweet us and follow us on Instagram at Bronxnet TV. And while you're there, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, FB, Insta Stories, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So, although we have flattened the curve with the spread of COVID-19, the pandemic continues to leave a major impact on children being forced to adjust to the new normal, dealing with socio-isolation, anxiety, and many other socio-emotional challenges. The I Raise Girls and Boys International Corporation is known for improving socio-emotional well-being for youth through programs created, including a petition to help the mental health stability of children during the pandemic. Joining us to tell us more, we welcome uh, I Raise Girls and Boys International CEO and founder, Shaniqua E. Moore. Hello, Shaniqua, and welcome. Hi, Rena. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be with you all today. We're excited to learn about all these programs you've created, and uh, I would like to be the first to acknowledge you for un knowing and understanding the importance of that aspect of our health being so crucial to uh, feeling and being healthy as well. And our children, uh, myself being a mom, uh, I, I understand you also offer programs for uh, the parents as well. However, starting with the children, based on the emergency and the circumstances in which they were just kind of like entrusted into uh, acclimating, it, 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 it has been really quite uh, still a shock factor in adjusting to what we're considering the new normal. And, and what does that look like for them later in the future, which is what we're going to discuss today? Yeah, thank you for asking that and, and for having this conversation. I think that Sometimes we, we forget to talk about the social emotional well-being and the psychological well-being of our children um, and what the new normal looks like. I think that we're all still trying to figure that out. 
Um, but I do know that our children, we've ser served over 300 children during COVID-19. And our kids were mainly having a lot of issues with anxiety, with stress. And um, we saw a rise of, of cases where kids were just really afraid. I mean, from the age of eight years old, kids were just afraid to die going outside. And so like that pervading fear and anxiety that had been resonating with our kids during COVID-19. I don't know how long it's going to take for us to look uh, for, for them to get past that but we definitely do need services like these in place to help our kids along their journey to healing and so the new normal I think we're all trying to figure that out we don't know yet I know that the Department of Education has an entire task force that's trying to come up with some strategies to keep our kids safe physically and also socially and emotionally so when you say um, you've serviced these kids that have been um trying to overcome anxiety and, and this fear, uh, what kind of services are we talking about, right? Because even at that level, we're still dealing virtually. So there's still a disconnect. So it's, it's really challenging from a, a mental state of well-being. Absolutely. It's it's really challenging um, because, again, we're, we're human beings, so we thrive off of social connections, off of human touch. So n the absence of that, it really um, it really is very challenging for our children. You have to think about it. Our kids were in school one day and the next day they were completely out of school. Just like that. Yep. Yeah, it was just it was an overnight thing. And so they were not prepared. They were not ready for this sudden change that were going to take place in their life. Right now, our kids are they're, they're not in their classrooms. They're not with their peers. They're they're not able to go to, you know, to Chuck E. Cheese and to Billy Bees and to their favorite social places because of COVID-19. And so although we've been serving them virtually, there is the absence of that social connection that kids yearn for and that kids so desperately need. Um, through our programs, although we, we have not been providing in-person uh, services because of complying with COVID-19 uh, COVID regulations, but we've been able to provide mental health services for children virtually. We've also been able to provide a lot of educational and recreational activities for kids online Monday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, we've been providing yoga and meditation. We've been providing visual arts, performing arts, music and production, um, Lego classes, tutoring, mentoring, and the list goes on. And although, again, we're, we're not able to reach our kids uh, physically, we have been able to reach their hearts. And we just had our art showcase last Saturday, and our kids were just giving their testimonials of how they have been touched by our program and how our program has really helped them get through COVID-19. So because um, you're offering this to, uh, you know, uh, communities that are um, in dire need of this kind of assistance, right? Um, and there's a petition going around for the governor to understand the importance of these services. How do you qualify people to be, is there a registration fee or is it, is it free? Uh, is there a limited amount of, of kids that can register? Like what are the age ranges? And then what are the different programs? Like it's not that they sign up for each program. I mean, you named uh, quite a few. So I was just wondering how you qualify the individuals for whatever program is recommended. Sure. And thanks for that question. So we are open to any child in New York State that's in need of services between the ages of four and 19 years old. That's the only qualification. They don't need anything else other than to be a child between that age and to be residing in the state of New York. Um, and, and there are a variety of programs. And we really leave that up to the parents because the parents know best what their kids need. And so what we do is we have an open application. And on that application, we have a host of programs and services that our parents are able to select according to what they want their child to be in. And that really varies, again, depending on the child. Um, and most of our parents, I would say, they register their kid for at least, I want to say, a minimum of three classes. Um, and so that looks very different for every parent. But again, registration is open now. We just opened registration for our summer academy last night, and that starts July 5th. 
It runs all the way until August 28th. It is free. We do not charge for any services. It's a free service to the community. And so right now we are open in applications up to 500 children. So it is first come first serve basis. We have a host of facilitators and teachers that are already uh, ready to serve our kids. They have a curriculum that they follow throughout the summer and they're excited. One of our new programs that we'll be offering literacy and creative writing, which we've not offered before. Um, and we'll also be offering financial literacy for our kids, which is something that's really essential that our kids don't traditionally get. So we have a host of new programs and it's free for our, our community as long as they fit that age four through 19 and they're located in New York State. Wow, that's wonderful. That's amazing. And before we go, let's just share the parenting uh, workshop that you're going to be offering for parents who are also dealing with becoming remote learning teachers. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm one of them. I am I'm one of them too, Rena. I have an eight-year-old daughter and it's been so challenging for me and that's why we understand what our parents are going through we've been there with our parents from day one letting them know that we care and that we're there to support them we've been running parent support groups every single tuesday from 7 to 8 15 p.m having wonderful discussions and dialogues with our parents teaching them strategies to help them get through this difficult time our parents have been put in a role where they have become teachers and most of them are working from home and balancing that could be very hard especially when you have more than one child. And so we understand the challenges. The parent, our parent support group is ran by parents. So they understand what our parents are going through. And we we just actually had our parent uh, panel last week for parents that are raising kids of color, dealing with the difficulties and challenges that that comes with. Um, this summer, we're actually launching parent counseling. So for any parent that just needs, needs extra help, just needs extra support or emotional help, we are here. We love our parents. We understand what they're going through. And they're and it's open for them to register as long as they have a child enrolled in one of our programs. Um, and then finally, we do have a hotline for parents. It is uh, The number is 1-888-I-RAISE-8. And any parent in New York State that's going through anything, we have a, a, a line of uh, trained counselors uh, ready to assist any parent who may just need additional support or additional help. Um, they're on the line right now if you call. It's one 888 raise 8 They're trained and licensed counselors. And our hotline is open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. 5 p.m. And that service is specifically for parents. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you for the work that you're doing and servicing our next generation, Shaniqua. And thank you for bringing it to our viewers today. Thank you so much, Rena. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Once again, you guys, for more resources, you can call 1-888-IRAISE-8 and be sure to visit their website, iraiseinc.org for the summer programs. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll learn about a video premiere celebrating some of America's social justice heroes. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Open. So this 4th of July weekend, the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and Voices of the People's History of the United States have collaborated to celebrate the social justice heroes of the past and present. The video presentation will feature spoken word performances by 17 graduating seniors from Maxine Green School for Imaginative Inquiry in New York City. And joining us to tell us more, we welcome Lincoln Center Programming Director Jordana Lay and Maxine Green School for Imaginative Inquiry, APUS, <laughs> history teacher Jeffrey Ellis Lee. Hello, Hello. and welcome. Thank Hi. you for having us. <laughs> thank you for being with us. We are thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving a spotlight on this very important project to Lincoln Center and, and to Voices and to Maxine Green. It's really a very, very special project for us. 
Well, I think the timing is impeccable as well. Mm. I don't. I understand that this was initially going to be executed in May, so it's interesting that you've chosen to do it during the Fourth of July weekend. And um, there's so much social consciousness being brought into the forefront that um, I think this is a really great way for a lot of us to spend our independence weekend uh, this time around. Yeah. Definitely. Well, it's it's about American history. The project is overall about retelling and telling America's true history. And so we thought Fourth of July would be a great way to do this. Um, the project was originally supposed to happen at the David Rubenstein Atrium in May, and it's part of a five year ongoing relationship with Maxine Green and Voices. And when we had to go into isolation, we, Jeffrey and the Voices team really worked very hard with the students to make sure that they actually did a presentation. And so we're honored to be able to do this now. And so Jeffrey, um, as the yes. history teacher, right? I love how she said the real history. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very that. true. Yeah, very true. Because this is what we are going through right now. Right, um, right. And, and, and some of your subjects that have been chosen, or I don't know if you chose them, if the students chose them, but... Um, I will say in uh, reviewing the press release and going through some of the materials myself, mm -hmm. I found it to be very fascinating how it kind of uh, covers a, a, the spectrum of a rainbow um, mm. in, in, in subject matter as well as individuals. Well, the students actually spend two years with me um, and they look at a specific uh, area in history and they also look at a government policy that's connected to that. So the, the exploration that they um, and the empowerment that they go through is completely individual and it's chosen by them. Um, and they spend, because we are a school that focuses on inquiry, they really dig into the real history that surrounds that voice, uh, that policy, that history. Because as you pointed out, most of the history that we're taught in a textbook isn't the real history. And that's the beauty of this, that they get to, to look at the voice of a person who experienced it on the ground. And so why don't you share with us and share with our viewers who are some of the uh, speeches and or stories that are going to be shared this time around? Um, well, it, it ranges from and, and chronologically, um, you know, from the very beginning prior to, uh, you know, colonial history, prior to being the United States, all the way up to uh, modern times. Um, and some of the voices that always pop to the kids are uh, Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman. Um, I think every year we've had that. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Um, this year we have a um, couple of speeches that are um, from former and um, from slaves. And that was beautiful. We did a, a little mini Juneteenth celebration around those voices. And um, we go all the way through to modern times. Right. I noticed uh, you have an a, a undocumented youth advocate, uh, Gustavo Madrigal Piña. Yes. Right? That's, yes. This, that's not too far. That's not too many years ago. So No, it's not. It's definitely in the 2000s. I think that's from 2007 or 8. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a little old, but not yeah. massively. Right, right. right. But it, it centers all around the, the issue of DACA. Right. And, and so a this, lot of the student voices, pardon me, in no, my classroom. No, I'm, my apologies. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's your <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just, I was just saying. It, I was it, agreeing uh, with you. <laughs> it, it, it really resonates with a lot of the, the students in my classroom um, that, you know, have immigration issues. Um, and um, some of them, because of this, are able to experience something um, that never would have happened in just a traditional classroom. Right. And then there's the style of it, right? Because uh, some of the subjects uh, that, we're, that are being... Uh, discussed uh, have to do with Black Lives Matter, have mm -hmm. to do with, um, you know, disease and or, you know, the gay society. And mm -hmm. um, then there's the uh, immigration issue. And um, and then there's this all of us belonging uh, to American history. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. We True. lost Jeffrey for a second there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you are. You're there. I'm back. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because those issues, if you really like focus on, I guess we keep going back to the same idea of the real history, they've always been there. 
you know, they've always been there. They may take on a different uh, tone, a different color, but from the very beginning, it's these same issues that keep coming back. And we're really coming to this moment of reckoning right now where maybe we can actually finally deal with one of them. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that, would, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. And, and I just want to acknowledge you both, right, for taking this on. I mean, it's a commitment, obviously, that's been in, uh, occurring every year for the past five years. And the, the fact that now it's available to everyone virtually, I mm. think, is going to really have a, 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 a broader impact. Yeah, I, I want to also just really recognize what Jeffrey has done in his classroom and how he is this Thank amazing you. glue to these students, to making this happen. He is an inspiration and a force of nature. Um, I have seen Jeffrey handle the change from being in the classroom to being virtual. Mm. He's accommodated his own schedule so that the students could really be engaged and worked with them and has done everything from sending silly photos to <laughs> cracking the whip, but yeah. really so that mm. these that these students felt empowered and supported during this time. So I, I really mm. want to recognize that, that work that's been happening um, and it's it's pretty amazing and we at Lincoln Center love partnering up with Maxine Green and we love partnering up with voices and this is a, a very true passion project for all of us mm. and we've been working on this project that it goes we go into the we work with the students at least twice a month um, from the beginning of the school year to the end. Um, and then Jeffrey continues this, this energy throughout his curriculum and his work with the students. So it's a really holistic partnership. And it's been um, definitely the thing that gives me hope and inspiration. <laughs> That's lovely. That's I like that term. I like the phrase holistic, right? Because there is definitely. a sense of healing that comes with learning the real history. And then there's this other aspect of, of modernizing it, right? Because um, because of the circumstances, you also had to figure out a way to convey these messages and or deliver the presentation in um, an electronic form, in a video mm -hmm. form, which is what we're here to discuss today. So before we go, let, really quickly, let's just share a little bit about, I guess, the spoken word, the visuals, the, the music and everything that's going to accompany this style of presentation. Um, well, you know, the, the minute we went remote, um, March 13th, it was Friday the 13th, there was no way that I was going to allow this to not go forward because it is the highlight of the year. It's the highlight of my career. Mm -hmm. And to see those students empowered and become something that you knew was there, they had no idea it was there. It comes out of them. There was no way I was going to let this go. Um, so we found a way. Uh, we kind of blundered our way through the darkness um, and figured it out. And that's a testament to our partnership. And thank God this did not happen year one. Because <laughs> we have, we've developed uh, relationships with each other. Right. Um, and that really, that really helped out. And the relationships had already been established with the students in the classroom. You know, that, that, which was instrumental in being able to move forward. Because it really all is about relationships. So it's almost like a form of completion uh, for yes. everyone, for everyone. Yes. Yeah. And, and also a sense of relief, right? That uh, you were able to just get it done um, <laughs> at the end of the day. Well, there's been yeah, a lot of obstacles so right. and a lot of delays, you know, and um, mm. circumstances call for this type of, of presentation. Um, it's the consciousness, the social consciousness. And I just want to acknowledge you both for your commitment to our community and to the next generation. So thank you for bringing it here and sharing it with our viewers. Thank, thank you, you for very allowing us. Thank you. And once again, you guys, the Lincoln Center Voices of the People's History of the United States will premiere virtually at LincolnCenter.org and at Lincoln Center NYC live on FB on <laughs> Saturday, July 4th at 1 p.m. Make sure to tune in to those performances. All right, we got to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear how one artist is using her creativity to make funky and safe mask for the community. Don't go anywhere. <music> Hey everyone, 
welcome back to Open. Our next guest is a self-taught fourth generation artist and entrepreneur whose work has been exhibited throughout the United States. And her work reflects spirituality, culture, humanism, reality, and speaks of advocacy for women, culture, and current events. Today, she's here to discuss how she uses her creativity and culture to create safe mass through her fashion design label, Yo Soy Mia, which also means I am mine. Please welcome artist and my comadre, Mia Roman. Hi, Mia. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Good morning. And thank you for inviting me onto BronxNet. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being the fantabulous artist that you are. Okay? <laughs> it was just so important for us to share it with our viewers because I'm like, okay, here's the reality, everyone. Our new, our new norm is that we have to wear masks, right? And so we can talk about your your art um, trajectory in a really short short form um, with regards to painting on canvases and going from that into fashion and, and from that expanding into items, bags, and now masks. And you can share all of those lovely details. But for me, it was important for me to share with our viewers how if you're going to wear something on your face, it might as well look beautiful, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the masks were born in the same way that my fashion line was born, out of a necessity. So out of ne the masks were born out of necessity, love, and support. And the necessity truly is because of the whole COVID-19, we needed to protect ourselves and also to be responsible around others. So, and I was wearing the N95s and they're very good and they're protective, but being an artist myself, I just wanted something different. I wanted something nice. I wanted something that expressed uh, my energy and who I was. So that's how the masks were born. And so um, the beauty of everything that you do is that they're, they're all unique. And, um, and as I saw you beginning to design, um, I, I right away was like, oh, I need to have mine. So in case you guys are wondering what all of this is, this is my Yo Soy Mia collection. So this is my, <laughs> this is my daughter's, this is my other one. And then there's this one that, yeah. you know, because I wear a lot of pañuelos. That was my look for uh, what I call the Rona look. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm really proud of them, not only because they look beautiful, but because of the care you put into making them. Not only is it great material, I just wanted to share with everyone that they're adjustable, um, which is a big deal, right? So that uh, as the elastic stretches, you can actually tighten it so that it's secure on, yeah. on your ear. Um, and then there's the material, which you can share with our viewers, uh, the yeah. uh, material that you're using. So it was born out of three things, necessity, love, and support. The necessity is we needed something or I needed something to protect myself from not getting sick and also to be responsible around others. To uh, the love that was that's for art and for creativity and for fashion, I just needed to put my love and um, into this project. And then three, the support, the support of my friends, family, and also my boyfriend. At first I was like, oh, everybody's making masks. You can buy masks on the street for $5. They come from China, blah, blah, blah. And I was a little hesitant to make masks, but he supported me and he was like, you can do them. Nobody else has masks like this. So what I did was I did due diligence. I studied fabrics. I studied um, installation, liners, um, and elastics. I It was trial and error. I made several masks before I got the right pattern, before I got the right cut, before I got the right elastic. And not everybody wears the same size. We are not a one-size-fits-all uh, world. So that's why I really appreciate the adjustable straps. The ear straps are not only adjustable, but they're so soft to the ear. Not like that elastic that really bothers the tip of your ear when you wear it long periods of time. So I was able to, over time, it took me over a month to really gather all the information and gather all the materials. And then it just launched. Like it took a, a, a life of its own. It really did. Well, you know, and, and of course I'm cheerleading on the back, but 
I just in case everybody wants to know, you know, I bought them from her, right? So because <laughs> I just want to be clear because I'm gonna I'm gonna you know cheerlead on the side and let you know that uh, for those of you who saw the special that I did for the Latinx March, this is the mask that I wore. And the reason I'm bringing it out is because I can honestly say, you know, in the uh, amid marching with thousands of people, not once did I need to take this off. And it was hot that day. And that's a big deal, right? Because after a while you get hot and you can't breathe. And, you know, it's like challenging to breathe, I should say. Um, and I didn't really have the need to take it off for anything. Except, right. which is what we're going to allude to, is having a dream. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, the beautiful part of these masks are that they don't fall flat on the face. Right. So they're not squashing your nose. They're not right on top of your lips. Um, they're not suffocating to the face, unlike a lot of those other masks that are just straight cut. These are more form fitted to the face. Um, and I am as a responsible person. I did want to so start socializing with my friends and going out and doing things, but also taking responsibility for myself and for my community. So out of necessity, like my mom says, necessity is the mother of invention. I came up with a special mask, which is now part of my new line. So why don't you join me in a drink? Okay. Uh, right now I can only join you in coffee. Okay. This is cranberry juice because it's bright and early in the morning. Right. But the mask. Oh, wait, I have one of those. Oh, there you go. So we can rock together. Right. So I I always love wearing big earrings. So I suggest you put the earring in first. You put your mask on. So it's best to put the glasses over the mask. Okay. And then we can go for a drink. You mean you can go for a drink? Oh yes. my gosh, look at that. She made a little hole. <laughs> oh man, I got mine before you created that. So with these masks, we're still being responsible. We still can join our friends in any type of beverage, go out for a walk, go out for a chat, go out for some even maybe outdoor dancing and still be responsible while, join, while enjoying a nice cold beverage. Bravo, bravo, brilliant, brilliant. So I'm gonna probably order that one in a different design though, because <laughs> <laughs> the good thing that's about, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. thank you so brilliant. much. Now, the, the good thing about the masks are that they're all different because they're handmade. So sometimes they're, they come, this particular mask is, of one of my favorites, and it's a two-sided uh, mask, and this one has some studs on it. So I'm going to start decorating the masks with some funky kind of edges, and these also have the adjustable straps, so you just put them on and you um, tighten them up or loosen them up as you seem fit. Oh my gosh, wonderful. And thank you for bringing it to our viewers. Thank you for caring about your work in, in the way that you do, because it's very clear that you put a lot of care into whatever you put your hands on. And I say that because I know I'm wearing them. So I'm aware of how the material adjusts to your face and how the elastic adjusts to your ears. So that requires a, a certain level of care in, in uh, sizing as well, sizing up. I mean, it's not like you took measurements of my face and I know you can't do that for everybody, but just that alone uh, makes all the difference in making sure that we all remain responsible and wear a mask in public settings. Yeah, so why, who says you can't look good while you're wearing a mask, right? right. So wear a mask, wear a funky mask, get your masks um, ready because this summer it's gonna be the mask summer. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And and you might as well do it in style. If you're going to wear something on your face, you might yeah, as well do it. I say it all the time. Yeah, wear something lovely, colorful, and creative. All right. <laughs> Yo soy Mia, Mia Roman. Thank you for being here with us. Comay. Woo. Thank and you, you guys. so much. Whew. Yeah, thank no, you. thank you. I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that they can go to what? Is it your Etsy? They, I'm on Etsy as a Yo soy Mia. Um, designs and also they could go to my website at arts by Mia 
www.yosoymia.com or yosoymiadesigns.com. And there you have it. Did, I wanted to show uh, Charvita's mask, right? The little girl's mask. Because yes. in case anybody's interested in a mommy and me, really yes. quickly, I'm really so quickly. we're running seven. out of time. They're like, hey, hurry up. We got to wrap up. But I want to show them that you made uh, a smaller version as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. The kids can style it out too. Woo! All right. There you have it. Thank you. Te quiero mucho. Love you guys. All right. Once again, you guys, for a colorful online shopping experience of Mia Roman's handcrafted masks, bags, and clothing, clothing, excuse me, you can visit her Etsy.com shop, Yo Soy Mia Designs, and on Instagram, she's Yo Soy Mia 787. Don't go anywhere. Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. Coming up, part one of our interview with seven-time batting champion and baseball Hall of Famer Rod Carew. But first, with the return of baseball, we caught up with Yankee manager Aaron Boone. I know it's going to be challenging. Um, you know, there's going to be things on a daily basis that 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 make uh, you know playing uh, a little more challenging than obviously it otherwise would. Our job is to get ready, and that's how I look at it. And we've been working very hard the last several days now just trying to um, get things in order laying a foundation to try and put ourselves in a position to be able to win a championship and, and try and get our guys in the best possible position to go out and, and be successful the season is set to kick off later this month here now is part one with sir rodney we welcome in baseball immortal rod carew rod you must be excited about the return of baseball i am thrilled as there's trying to get some games going. But, you know, I, I look back and I, I think about it and, and I say, what about the health of the, of the guys, you know, and their families? Uh, what's more important, watching a baseball game or staying healthy? You know, I, for me, I, I can turn on my TV and watch uh, Western all day and all night, you know, and still, still have some fun doing that, the old co cowboy movies. You know, so that's what I do. I don't worry about the game that much uh, right now. I thought it was important for our fans at home, especially for our young fans, to know how incredible a career that you have had. I mean, 18-time All-Star, AL MVP in 1977, AL Rookie of the Year in 1977, seven-time batting champion. Your number is retired by both the Twins and the Angels, number 29. You're in the Hall of Fame for both of those clubs. And then, of course, the National Baseball Hall of Fame. You go on to hit 388 in one season, a lifetime batting average of 328. Of all those amazing accomplishments in your career, which one is tops? Well, you know, I think I played a game in Minnesota in 1977. And um, I received, I think, seven standing ovations in that one ball game because I was flirting with the 400 mark and I had taken my average above 420 or some crazy number like that. And so every time I came up or I popped my head out of the dugout, uh, the fans were giving me a standing ovation. And I think it, the, the big reason is that they came in, they saw me come into Minnesota as a young 20-year-old kid and kind of sort of worked my way back up to the, you know, to where I was that day. So, um, that's something that I'll never forget, something that I really and truly appreciate. So now, age 14, Rod, you end up coming to New York, actually Washington Heights, and you play semi-professional baseball for the Bronx Cavaliers, and that's how you were discovered for the major league. So you actually signed that first pro contract in a restaurant in the Bronx. Is that your fondest memory of being here in New York? Oh, yeah. You know, I used to play right outside of Yan Yankee Stadium, but at McCombs Field, and um, you know, the, 
I, I'll play some games and this, the same time the Yankees are playing. You know, I'd hear the crowd and I would say to myself that maybe one day I'll be playing in, in side of that stadium. And uh, sure enough, you know, the scout that saw me told the twins about me and uh, they decided to, to sign me to a contract. But I had fun, you know, playing in that league because that's that's where I was really noticed and scouts started coming to see me. And, you know, I had a chance to play in New York, but I didn't go to New York, um, even though, you know, I lived there. Um, the Twins deal seemed like it was a much better deal for me. And the Twins actually rushed to sign you because they wanted to keep you away from the Yankees. That was the story that I heard. Yeah, they... They invited me to work out with them uh, one one day when they came, was in town, and you know I was hitting the ball out of the ballpark, you know, um, and and driving the ball to all fields, and they, they didn't want the Yankees to see me, so they said, you know, get that kid out of there. So uh, they were hiding me from the Yankees. So uh, I ended up signing with them. And, I've had a, you know, had a pretty good career with them playing there for about 12 years. Oh, well, it's definitely a smart move to keep you from the Yankees, no doubt about that. Now, Rod, I would be remiss not to ask you about the, you know, we talk about the coronavirus pandemic a little bit, but I also wanted to get your thoughts on the social inequality that's in the world today, because you were born on a segregated train in Panama. In fact, your name comes from the doctor that, that delivered you. I wanted to get your thoughts and to see what you think of, of where the country is right now in, in terms of making any real progress towards racial equality. The, the country has come a long way. Um, and people that are running the government has is, is made that great improvement. But, you know, when I was coming up, it was, uh, it was hard. You know, uh, I, I face racism every single day. And I, you know, my, the thing about it is my mom never told me, she always, she always told me to, you know, not pay attention to that, that, you know, you've got God in your pockets, he's going to take care of you. So I, I never really concerned myself too much about that stuff. And then when I came to this country and I played uh, in the Florida State League and the Carolina League, you know, that also followed me there. And I learned from what my mom had said to me, if you're going to play baseball, just go and play baseball and not worry about what the people in the stands are saying or what they're yelling to you. So just go out and have fun. I think it's a very trying time around the country right now and also around the world. And, you know, that also includes conversations about patriotism. Now, you were also in the military. So I was just interested on your thoughts on Colin Kaepernick and also kneeling during the national anthem, because that's been a hot-button topic as well. Well, you know, I respect uh, the flag, and I respect this country uh, tremendously because it has given me a great life, and um, it, it has taught me some things, and I just want to continue being a part of this country and doing what I can to help this con country continue to grow. So when I see things... Um, like all the rioting and all this stuff on television, you know, I, I just get upset because to me, um, it's okay if you're going to protest, but do it in a manner that uh, you're not destroying anything because then you have to turn around and rebuild what you've destroyed. And the young people have to, you know, they, they have to understand that and they, they just can't keep doing this and, and, and breaking into stores and taking what's not theirs. And, you know, it's just a tough times we're going through right now. So um, hopefully we'll get over it and get past it some, somehow. I think there are some people right now that have done a good job of spreading the good word and, and taking part in the message that matters most. And then there are some that, are, of course, are taking advantage of the situation. Yeah, that's true. There are those that... Um, they don't care about other people. They only care about themselves and what they can get out of it. And to me, that's wrong. You know, you have to care about the other people that uh, maybe not having uh, good times with their lives and stuff. And, you know, we, we, we just have to come together and, uh, 
and, and try and save America, America the Great. So, you know, um, I'm hopefully trying to do my part with participating in things for kids uh, with cancer and things like that. How did you turn all of these tragedies really into good opportunities, especially in helping other people? As a youngster growing up in Panama, I had, you know, with all the abuse that I was going through, my mother was always in my corner. And she always said to me, you know, God's going to protect you. He's going to uh, give you things and he's going to bless you. And um, just have faith and have faith in him. And, you know, I when I when I had my massive heart attack, you know, I just told him, I talked to God and I says, I'm not afraid to die. Um, so take me in your arms and, and do what you want with me. And so he decided to leave me on this earth to continue helping others. So um, I appreciate that. I know that I'm blessed and I'm going to continue trying to do my best and, uh, and follow in his, in his footsteps. That was part one of our interview with seven-time batting champion, Baseball Hall of Famer, Rod Carew. Tune in next time for part two. Welcome back. Our last guest is a multidisciplinary artist whose artistry is rooted in the rhythm and soul of tap dance. She's starred in musicals such as Singing in the Rain, 42nd Street, and most recently, Anita in the West Side Story. Joining us to share more about her performance pivot, please welcome Amanda Castro. Hey, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rena. How are you? I'm good, sweetie. How you doing? I'm hanging. Listen, one day at a time. That's one, it. <laughs> one day at a time is what it is. And, you know, I introduced you um, in this realm of pivoting because um, I have been following you on Instagram. And, um, well, before we even get to that, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. Before we all ended up in quarantine, you, my dear, were um, cast in this phenomenal role of playing Anita in mm -hmm. the West Side Story. I know you were on the national tour, and I'm going to assume that was leading into really great things and everything got put on pause. So how has that impacted you? You know, listen, it's, it's literally one day at a time playing, you know, Anita is such an iconic role. West Side Story is, you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a play, it's a musical in history, you know, whether we want it to be or not, it is. Um, and, you know, I think when I when I first when I first started doing West Side Story, it was at the Houston Grand Opera, and I was Consuelo, and I was covering Anita, and I had learned so much. It was my first time working in an opera house. It was a whole new dynamic. Um, I met. I think I didn't know anybody there. Um, and as I kept, I, in the next role, in the next time I did uh, West Side Story, I did get to play Anita. And, you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure. This role is iconic. You know, she's the one Puerto Rican in the movie. What are we going to do? Um, but that kind of started my musical theater journey. You're referring the first... to Rita Moreno, though, not the character. <laughs> You're like, well, she... yeah, you... right, both, <laughs> right, yeah. The case, Just to right. be clear, so we're all clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I'm assuming everybody knows this information, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the just just playing her, the history of Rita, you know, like, you know, but yeah, that was kind of the beginning. The first show that I had done was in the Heights, and then I had done West Side a bunch of times through all of these opera houses, and you know, it really, it thickened my skin um, right. in a really, really good way. I learned a lot. I got my chops up. Um, but yeah. yeah, musical theater has definitely been a pivot for me. Um, <laughs> then going to do, then after that, I the, the last West Side I did was at the Lyric Opera of Chicago, which was a huge theater. We performed for over 100,000 people uh, in our run there. Which That's I amazing. Think, Congratulations. Oh, thanks. I cried every day. I have no shame. I was, you know, I thank God every day. Uh, 
Yeah, and then I did 42nd Street at the Ordway Theater uh, by uh, Jared Grimes. So, so musical the theater, theater, right, I get it. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because I think you're one of the most phenomenal tap dancers I've ever, ever seen in, in, in our, this day and age. Uh, really, and, and I we've had a few, and we know a few, and I think every, especially women in this genre. But you have this whole other thing going on that is really, really captivating and mesmerizing. Thank you. It's tap. It's funny because uh, right now, especially within quarantine, I'm trying. I'm trying to look back to go forward. Um, you know, and seeing how. I've done, I grew, I actually grew up, I feel like I grew up in a place where nobody actually told me that I could tap dance. Right. Like it was always the the genre that was like on the back burner that wasn't that important, but I thought it was important. And it's something that I love to do and not many people love to do it. Um, you know, in college there was no tap dance and I got kicked out of studios while I was doing it, you know. Um, and I really, I say this, I say this with a full heart that when I got to New York City, that's when I feel like I became a student of tap dance and I'm still very much a student and learning what my voice is. Um, but coming here, um, learning the true, the true history of what tap dance is. Tap dance is black, tap dance is jazz, tap dance is resistance, tap dance is your voice. Um, and I think right now, something that I'm struggling with and grappling with, especially being home and not, not having access to places to tap dance as much as I would like to is, you know, the permission to speak freely. Um, so yeah, I think that's <laughs> like, you know. Uh, um, no, I'm laughing because it's amazing how you found yourself a spot, which we're gonna share with everyone later yeah, where that I, spot is, which I think is amazing, uh, an amazing union of you and the sky, and that's as much as I'm gonna say. So yeah, you know, it's a lot of searching and a lot of, you know, who's gonna come and get me or not, right. but we're gonna do this until I get in trouble. Um, right. You know, in our discussion of pivoting and transitioning and just reacclimating and redesigning, um, I understand that uh, you've you've had a loss in your family uh, most recently, and um, you know uh, the transitions occurring now uh, during our this pandemic are, are quite different, right? Of an experience. Yeah. So my condolences first and foremost. Thank you. Who did you lose? I lost my aunt. It's Why? it's definitely been you know it's different it's a whole different way of shifting i you know we we got the news and we all got the news spread out so we weren't even able to convene as a family um which is heartbreaking i you know uh we had to wait because all of all of the places where you can hold services were backed up which is like i don't wish any of these feelings on my worst enemy because they're very painful um but you know, it took weeks. It took weeks for us to like get information and to, you know, finally like, to finally lay her to rest in a way that you know is respectable. Um, and you know, it. Were you able to attend the funeral? No, right? Yeah. Well, you... we 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 had a they they had a very small funeral with like five to seven people. That's all I that see. was allowed, and that was weeks. Of, like everything was in sections. Not, it wasn't all like in the same week. Um, and you know, when we, when we, uh, when we did her burial, we were able to like all spread out and be outside. And, you know, we had, we had services that were beautiful, you know, they were beautiful. And I'm glad we had to, we had social distanced, we had a social distance burial, which right. is like, yeah. how, when you feel your family crying next to you and you don't know if you can hug them or not, and they're hurting like that. And I say that, I say that. So other people know that we're out here. It's happening. You're not by yourself, um, right? You know, right? Um, and and then in, and then this kind of all leads back to um, what you've been doing in in your form of of uh, therapy, which is through the art form of dance. And mm -hmm. um, and I want you. I would like for you to share with our viewers what you've been doing. And all I've been saying is that you're dancing in the sky. <laughs> But if you could set us up before we yeah. go, because I want them to understand that we're all grieving in different forms and we have to take that energy and transform it in whatever it is we're about. And as mm -hmm. artists, we're part of phase four, I think. So we're mm -hmm. like, 
the last of the Mohicans. Yeah, listen, I definitely dance. I've gone in and out of dancing throughout quarantine, but I will say dance is an act of resistance and joy is an act of resistance. So putting them together, you got, you got an army. Uh, you got an army in you and behind you and you're surrounded. Ooh, at the same time. Um, what I did for you, what I did for you today, Rena, is just I, I call it a morning meditation. It's it's a little bit of movement and it's a little bit of tap dance. Um, but yeah, leaning into me being a forever student and hopping in and out, uh, hopping in and out of dance and quarantine and trying to do as much as I can and you know, continuing to try to find my voice and to share it so we all so my community knows that I'm here, we're here, and we're here to work and we're here to keep it moving because we got this. We got this, we can yeah. do it. We got this, we got this, and we so appreciate you bringing it here to our viewers because I've been following you on Instagram mm -hmm. and I gotta say it has been therapeutic for me because cuando tu baila, tu baila con gana. <laughs> like, yes, Amanda, I'm so there with you. You guys, you gotta thank stay you. tuned. Yes, thank you thank for being you. here with us, querida. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. See you. Pa, 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 pa. Right, Vamos. We, gotta take, <laughs> we gotta take a quick break, but when we return, Amanda Castro, she's gonna perform for us in the sky. Don't go anywhere. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's now time for this week's Open Artist Spotlight. Here now to perform a dance of resistance, exuding joy. Please welcome Amanda Castro. She can say in her voice, in her way, that she love me. With her eyes, with her smile, with her belt, with her hands, with her money. I am the thesis of her prayers. Her nieces and her nephews are just pieces of the layers. Only one she love as much as me is Jesus Christ and Taylor. I got a future song singing for my grandma. You sing it too, but your grandma ain't my grandma. Mine's handmade, pan fried, sun dried, south side. And beat the double by landslide, praying with her hands tied. President of my fan club, Santa. Something told me I should bring my money. Yeah, This is the truth. I'm pessimistic on Monday. If I had tweaked and missed you, you look so good with the hat on. Had to mess with the shoe. Came and dressed in the satin. I came and sat in your view. I come to Christmas for dinner. 50 rolls on my plate. Hella holes in my stocking, holding your pockets in place. I like my love with the budget. I like my hugs with a sin. You smell like light gas while the electricity rent. You smell like right that gospel cry. I got so tired. Basis, so I gotta try it. You my dream, catch a dream, team, team, catch a man up like I ain't seen you in a minute. Let me take my budget. Try it. Dance. 
That is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests for coming through. And to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recablecast tonight, 24 hours a day at bronxnet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, mi amor, happy Independence Day, and be safe. Don't forget to wear your mask.